So yesterday we started talking about interval diffeomorphisms, if you remember. And in particular, we were looking at two interval diffeomorphisms that have just two fixed points. So if they have just two fixed points, then these fixed points must be the endpoints, right? And so, and the graph cannot intersect the diagonal, so it must be something like this. So one diffeomorphism might be, must be something like this, and the other one must be something like this. Um, so the proof, I thought I should go into the proof, but actually thinking about it, it is really straightforward, so I will leave it. It's exactly like in the, the proof that they're topologically conjugate. So I stated um, yesterday the fact that any two such interval diffeomorphism are topologically conjugate. Notice, of course, that, um, uh, yes, yeah, so you, all you do is you construct the conjugating homomorphism exactly in the same way as we constructed it the other day, constructing a fundamental domain, fundamental domain here, okay? Because as we saw, all the points move from left to right, from one, di from one fixed point to the other, right? Because we proved that the only omega and alpha limits are fixed points, so all points have to move from one fixed point to the other, so they have to cross this fundamental domain and you can do the whole construction exactly in the linear case, okay? So rather than spending valuable lecture time doing this construction, I will let you do it as an exercise. It would be a very good exercise, yeah? There's really nothing to it. You look at the proof for the linear case, and it's exactly the same in this case, okay? So these are topologically conjugate, and what we are more interested in is in the general case in which we have many fixed points. Uh, what will happen. And this also is not so difficult. So let me remind you, first of all, that we say that F, um, so that if F from I to I is an interval, is an orientation preserving interval diffeomorphism, I always mean at least a C1 diffeomorphism when I say diffeomorphism. If P is a fixed point, right, we say that P is hyperbolic. If F prime of P is different from 1, and we say that F is hyperbolic. If all fixed points are hyperbolic, So why do we insist on this hyperbolicity of the fixed point and the hyperbolicity of F? So the first lemma is that if P is a hyperbolic fixed point, then it is isolated. You know what isolated means? Exactly. Okay, it's isolated as a fixed point. So there exists neighborhood U of P such that um, uh, all X different from P with x in u are not fixed. So why is this true? It's a C1 diffeomorphism. So 
Converges to the fixed point. Um, I think your basic idea is right. I'm not sure, however, yeah, I'm not sure if um, how easily you can actually prove it with that argument. But actually, it's very simple. If you have, this is the diagonal. What does it mean that the fixed point is hyperbolic? It means that the derivative at the fixed point is different from 1. Right? And if the derivative is different from 1, because this is C1, it means there is some neighborhood. So this is the fixed point P. It means there's some neighborhood where the derivative is also different from 1. Right? So if P is hyperbolic, P hyperbolic implies F prime of P is different from 1. Um, so there exists neighborhood u such that f prime of x is different from 1 for all x in u, right? Now suppose that there was another fixed point. Suppose by contradiction, suppose by contradiction, there exists q in u with f of q equals q. Okay? So what would that mean? That would mean that this comes back like this. So how can this be possible? If there's a fixed point here and there's a fixed point here and the derivative here is bigger than 1, then it means by the mean value, by the uh, mean value theorem, right, that there must be some point here where the derivative is equal to one, and this contradicts the assumption in this neighborhood. Okay, because the only way you can map, you can have uh, a map that maps f of p to p, uh, f of p equals p and f of q equals q, is if you have one point in inside where the derivative is equal to one, because you have f Okay, then f of p minus f of q equals p minus q. Okay, and so by the mean value theorem, there exists some z in the interval pq such that f of p minus f of q equals f prime of z times p minus q. Okay, so this means the derivative at z is equal to 1, which contradicts the assumption. Okay. So f prime of z equals to 1, contradiction. So this is the formal argument. The intuitive geometric argument is, is quite clear, right? It's just that since the derivative is different from 1, then the graph crosses the diagonal transversely, and therefore there must be some neighborhood where it cannot cross it again. Otherwise, it would not cross it transversely. But this is the formalization of this argument here. Okay, so why is it important that this map is isolated, that these points are isolated? Well, an immediate consequence Corollary is that if P is hyperbolic, that, sorry, if F is hyperbolic, so if all the fixed points are hyperbolic, then F has at most a finite number. fixed points. Why is this? Why is this? Corollary. Can you tell me? Because of this one, if you think the number of root of 
Yes. Each point is isolated. Wait, 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 wait. Why does this imply finite number of fixed points? Ani, do you know? Why? If there's an infinite number, then you would have some neighborhood of what that would have an infinite number of fixed points? Ba? I think it's just, uh, <coughs> e is compact. That's right. I is compact. I is compact. And so? And so if we make an in problem, we have an, an finite sub problem. And so? I mean, that's basically correct, but you need to make a link in terms of fixed points. <laughs> you know, for one fixed point, uh, the fixed points are isolated. Right. That just means we have, uh, for, for each fixed point, we have a, a, a neighborhood. A neighborhood, yeah, but you can have a countable number of disjoint neighborhoods. That's not a problem. Yes. But if we make an uncovering, You don't need to cover it. I mean, you can just take a countable number of fixed points, and each one has its own neighborhood, and they're all disjoint, and you can still have that. I mean, your argument is going in the right direction. You just need to complete it. What's... Yes? Just a minute. Okay, perhaps the interval is compact. Yes. I don't know. This covering argument, I don't think it's, yeah. OK. 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 And where's the contradiction? OK. The limit point is not isolated. Exactly. OK. Very good. This is the simplest argument. So proof I is, I is compact. So. If there exists uh, infinite fixed points, okay, there exists an accumulation point, P, which is fixed. Why is it fixed? Why is this accumulation point fixed? Exactly, okay? Check this. So this is by continuity. Okay, you should check this. Exercise, check this, okay? Is uh, P which is fixed and not isolated by definition. So it cannot be hyperbolic. Okay? So P... It's not hyperbolic, contradiction. Okay, contradiction. (laughs) 
Okay, so this already says that this definition of hyperbolicity, it's a significant condition, okay? So we are restricting us, it, it implies already quite a lot of things because of course there's lots of different morphisms that may have an infinite number of fixed points. But the hyperbolicity is a very natural condition and it gives already quite a lot of uh, information about what happens. So the main proposition we will prove here, proposition, is that if F and G are two interval diffeomorphism, okay, orientation preserving C1 diffeom and hyperbolic with the same number of fixed points with the same number um, okay, maybe I should say it differently. Uh, hyperbolic, okay. Then F, G are topologically conjugate if and only if they have the same number of fixed points. So I will sketch the proof of this. Although, again, it was very, it's fairly simple because it will be similar to the proofs we've done before. First of all, let me just uh, say a, a simple corollary. So what are the topological conjugacy classes of orientation-preserving C1 hyperbolic diffeomorphisms? How many are they and how are they characterized? as an immediate consequence of this proposition. Sorry? So exactly what this proposition is saying is that if you take all the hyperbolic, the, all the space of hyperbolic orientation preserving C1 diffeomorphism, this splits exactly into a countable number of topological conjugacy classes where each conjugacy class is characterized just by the number of fixed points of that diffeomorphism. Right? So for each number n equals 5, 6, there is a topological conjugacy class. All the interval diffeomorphisms, C1, orientation preserving C1 hyperbolic diffeomorphism with 5 fixed points are all topologically conjugate to each other, if and only if. Right? So, um, um, conjugacy classes of hyperbolic orientation preserving C1 diffils are characterized by the number of fixed points. This is not even really corollary. It's just a different way to state exactly the same result. Um, so characterize means that that is the only information you need, the number of fixed points, and you got your conjugacy class. So how do we prove this proposition? So one direction is clear, right? Kevin, which direction is obvious in this proposition? There's if and only if, right? Which one is that? So we need to say, if they have different number of fixed points, they're not topologically conjugate. And if they have the same number of fixed points, then they are topologically conjugate. Which of these is obvious? The 
if they have the same number of fixed points, then they're topologically conjugate. That's one direction. The other direction, if they do not have uh, the same number of fixed points, then they're not topologically conjugate. If and only if. Which one is obvious? Do you understand the difference between these two, right? We take two, we take two interval diffeomorphisms. You look at them, say, OK, do they have the same number of fixed points? We want to prove they're topologically conjugate or they do not have the same number of fixed points, then we need to prove that they're not topologically conjugate, right? if and only if. Which one's the first one? <laughs> yes, that's right, but that's the second one that I said. <laughs> they should have, so anybody else can tell me? Can you tell me which is the obvious direction in this proposition? <coughs> Why is that? Why? The answer is correct, but the question is why? If they don't have some name, number of fixed points, they cannot be topologically conjugate. Why? What does a topological conjugacy need to, what structure does a conjugacy need to preserve? What? <laughs> yes, it should preserve fixed points, at least, right? This is the most basic, fundamental property of e, not even topological conjugacy, just conjugacy. If two systems have different numbers of fixed points, they cannot be conjugate. Right? Okay. So one direction here is clear. What we need to show is that they, if they have the number, same number of fixed points, then, uh, then they are conjugate. Okay? So let's suppose we have F from AB to itself, and G from some other interval, A prime, B prime to itself. Okay, and let's suppose they have the same number of fixed points. So let's suppose that we have A equals A1, A2, AS equals B, are the fixed points of A and A prime equals A prime 1, A prime 2, A prime um, S, because it's the same number of fixed points, equals B prime, are the fixed points of G. Right? So we have In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six fixed points, right? So, one, two, three, four, five, six fixed points. So, this is A1, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And a six, a one prime, a two prime, a three prime, a four prime, and a five prime, and a six prime. This is this is how the picture must be, okay? The only thing that can change is the number of fixed points, but this is how it needs to be. So notice, of course, that between, by definition, this is a diffeomorphism. There's a finite number of fixed points 
between any two fixed points, the picture is either like this or like this, right? The picture is always the same between any two fixed points. If this is um, AI and AI plus 1, um, AI, AI plus 1, okay, then this is the diagonal. So I'm kind of zooming in to this part. And then the picture will always be, say, either like this or below the diagonal, right? But it always looks in one of these two shapes. And what does this remind you of? Well, it reminds us of the previous case, <laughs> where we had only two fixed points. What is the difference? It looks exactly the same. So what we have here is that this interval, AI, AI plus 1, maps also to the interval AI, AI plus 1, because AI maps to AI. AI plus 1 maps to AI plus 1, right? You can see it here. So A3 maps to this. It's a fixed point by definition. So this is also A3. This here is A4. So this is also A4, right? So really what you have is the interval A3 this interval here, A3, A4, mapping to the interval A3, A4, right? So as a diffeomorphism. So this itself is an interval diffeomorphism that I can draw like this, right? If I want, I can draw it. I could draw it really. Uh, I could, I could. Here I try to draw as an example of how it is as part of the bigger picture. But if you just restrict yourself to this, what you get is a map of this interval into itself that looks exactly like this. And it's got two fixed points that are exactly at the end points. So the reason I'm telling you this is because this is the clue to the construction of the homeomorphism. So how do you suggest we construct this homeomorphism here? Well, we can do it step by step, right? So let's look at this interval here, a1, a2. which is an interval diffeomorphism. And let's look at the corresponding interval here, also A1, A2, which is also an interval diffeomorphism. Both of them have just two fixed points at the end points. So what did we just prove before? That they're topologically conjugate. Okay, the map is topologically conjugate. So it means we can define a homeomorphism from A1, A2 to A prime 1, A prime 2, which conjugates the dynamics inside these two, inside these two intervals. Okay? And notice, of course, that this is made of pieces that are all independent of each other. So this basically this diffeomorphism can be split up. This interval A1, A2 maps to A1, A2. So when you start in here, you stay in here forever. Right? And when you start inside this interval, you stay inside this interval forever. In, indeed, we saw exactly what happens, right? What happens is that every point in here will map, will converge under iteration either to one fixed point or the other fixed point. So it's very simple. It's just like the dynamics when you have just two fixed points like this. So we construct a homeomorphism between this interval and this interval. Then we construct a homeomorphism between A2 and A3 that maps to the A2 A prime, A3 prime, and so on. And we do it for each of these intervals. And because these homeomorphisms coincide on the endpoints, right, this homeomorphism maps A2 to A2 prime, and this, this homeomorphism also maps A2 to A2 prime, then they come together to construct, to become one big homeomorphism from the whole interval to itself. Right? So it's very straightforward, really. So um, define for each interval AI, AI plus 1 uh, and AI prime, AI plus 1, we can uh, define 
a conjugacy H from AI, AI plus 1 to A prime I, A prime I plus 1. HI, let's call this HI. And then let H from A B on the whole interval to A prime B prime be defined by H restricted to A I A I plus one to be simply equal to H I. Any questions? It's okay? No? What are your doubts? Did I go too fast? I see some puzzled faces, and I'm not sure which part of this argument is puzzling. So do you agree that on each interval between two fixed points, the dynamics is just like the dynamics of intervals with two fixed points that we studied before? So on this map, we have an interval that maps to itself with only two fixed points. And on this interval, we have also an interval that maps to itself with these two points, okay, that with only two endpoints. And so there's a conjugacy, there's a map a homeomorphism between the interval A2, A3, which I call HI, to HAI prime A prime I plus 1, which conjugates the dynamics restricted to these two intervals. Okay, it exactly has the conjugacy property. If you take a point in here and you map F, it maps to the image of, the, of, of H of this point here. It exactly is a conjugacy between the dynamics restricted to these two intervals. Okay? And then you can define, because all these maps HI, they're defined independently, but they coincide. So H1 maps this interval to this interval. H2 maps this interval to this interval. They both are defined at the point A2, but they both have the same image as the point A2. So this is, they're all consistent with each other. So you can just define a home, global homeomorphism by defining this homeomorphism to be equal to H1 restricted to this, H2 restricted to this, and so on. And then it's not difficult to check that this is a conjugacy. Okay, let me maybe write it as an exercise just to check this. But exercise H is a conjugacy, is a topological conjugacy. Between F and G. The pasting lemma. Yes. What's the pasting lemma? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because if we uh, then concentrate uh, each each i. Are you yes? You're right. You're right. You're, yes. You right. You're right. So yes, I kind of assume that you're right. But in in principle, we'd have to show that h defined in this way is continuous. Yes. But that's why I was remarking that it has the same. The yes, because. Uh, the continuity from the left comes from the fact that it's a, it's, a, it's a homeomorphism here. The continuity from the right comes from the fact that it's a homeomorphism on the other interval. So it's continuous from the left and from the right because they have the same image. You're right. This is an observation that should be made. Thank you. Yeah. And the fact that it's a conjugacy follows immediately from the fact that it's a conjugacy on each interval independently, right? And these intervals, they do not mix. Points that are in this interval stay in this interval in forward and backward time forever, and so on. So it's a conjugacy on each interval independently, and so it's, an int it's a conjugacy globally. Okay. 
So you see this uh, technique of fundamental domains that we introduced in the linear case has already proved quite powerful in general cases. Like we've already used it. We, we looked at it in detail in the case of linear systems, and then we used it. I did not repeat the argument because it's exactly the same. We used it in the special case in which we have an interval diffeomorphism with just two fixed points. And then, interestingly, that was sufficient to do the general case because the general case reduces to a finite number of intervals, each of which is exactly that property of having just two fixed points and the endpoints. Okay. All right. So now we want to, now that we have really classified, okay, this is part of the goal at each of these steps. You take a class of systems and you classify them up to topological conjugacy. We have essentially done this. And now we want to address again, as we did in the linear case, the question of structural stability. Remember what structural stability means? You perturb the system a little bit, and does it remain inside the same conjugacy class? So to do this, we need to introduce a very important, interesting concept, which is what do we mean by a small perturbation of this map? In the linear case, it was obvious, because the linear maps are parameterized by the real line. A of x equals ax, so you just change a a little bit, and you get another linear map. Here we don't have such a parameterization. Here we just have interval diffeomorphism, and we want to perturb this a little bit. So we need to give a meaning to what we mean by perturbing this a little bit. Any suggestions for what we mean by small perturbation of this? So, uh, okay, let me draw another picture because this one... So let's, let's briefly think of intuitively how you would go about defining a small perturbation of this. So let's suppose we have a map, an interval diffeomorphism that looks, therefore, say like this. So it's got two fixed points. Uh, sorry, it's got four fixed points. What is a small perturbation of this? Well, that is something that we will have to... Yes, uh, that's what you would like from... You'd kind of like... if. If you can find a way of defining a small perturbation to guarantee that it doesn't change the number of fixed points, you would automatically get structural stability, as long as they're still hyperbolic. So it, it should not change the number of fixed points, and they should remain hyperbolic, and then uh, you guarantee structural stability. right? Um, so what kind of perturbation can we define to make sure that that happens? Excuse me? So, okay, so you could just shift everything up and down. You have a little bit of a problem because these are fixed, these two points. So you cannot, because it's a diffeomorphism of the interval, this is, will always map here and this will always map there, right? You cannot change that. So you can't really shift the whole thing up, although the intuition is natural to say, okay, can we shift it up or down a little bit? But maybe we can just shift it up or down in different places, right? Sorry? Point-wise, point yes. So we could, we could say, OK, this is, remains closed. We could just say the graph is close to this. The new graph is close to the old graph. Epsilon. Very good. So let's define what we call the C0 distance. So let f, g, from i to i, be continuous maps. Then we define what's called the C0 distance between f and g is equal to the supremum for all x in i of um, 
f of x minus g of x. Supremum, which in this case is also maximum because i is compact, so I could write maximum here. So what does this mean? This means that for every point x, so we have two, suppose we have two maps here. For each point x, you look at f of x and g of x, and you take the distance between them, and you take the supremum of all of this. This is sometimes called the uniform norm or, or C0, C0 distance, C0 metric, C0 distance, or, or uniform norm. Sometimes it's also called uniform. No. Okay, so if so um, d0 fg is less than or equal to epsilon if f of x minus g of x is less than or equal to epsilon for all x in i. Right, this is what this means. So what can we change within an epsilon neighborhood. So suppose we, um, let me just draw this picture again. Suppose we start with one map. Okay, so suppose you say you choose an epsilon and you say, okay, let's look at all the maps within this epsilon neighborhood. How much can the situation change? So what does it, choosing an epsilon mean? It means that for each point, for each x, the new map is allowed to be within an epsilon, plus or minus epsilon distance. The new graph is, is contained. If this is f of x, then g of x is allowed to be within this epsilon neighborhood of f of x. Right? So really you have a kind of neighborhood of the graph, an epsilon neighborhood. I mean, I've drawn it quite big, but of course you can imagine it very small. Okay. So the new graph is, needs to be contained in this okay, for small epsilon. So following your suggestion here, can we change the number of fixed points with a graph that lies inside this epsilon neighborhood of f. We cannot? Maybe? If it's uh, like oscillating too much, it, it may oscillate about. So it is just like the diagonal. So for example, maybe I can draw something like this. doesn't even need to oscillate that much. It just, can I avoid this by making epsilon smaller? Yeah, I mean, I do this picture with this size, but of course I can scale down the whole picture and I can draw it with arbitrarily small epsilon, right? So what does this suggest? That with this notion of distance, even hyperbolic maps will not be structurally stable. Because however small the epsilon I choose, I will be able to find inside, I will be able to find another map G which is within it, which is close enough to f, but has a different number of fixed points, and therefore is, belongs to a different topological conjugacy class, so the system is not structurally stable. But I can also have different notions of distance here, and this is 
why it's very interesting to think of different topologies. So this distance, this is a metric, uh, and you should check this. I will put it in the exercise to check. This is actually a metric on the space of continuous maps. Just also a small observation is that this is a, actually a metric that's defined on all continuous maps, not necessarily invertible. Okay? But of course, all homeomorphisms are a subset of this, and so this defines a metric also on the space of all homeomorphisms. Um, this is a metric. As a metric, it induces a topology on the space of continuous maps. This is the topology. The topology says that these two points are close if they're within, their graphs are within epsilon of each other. We can define a different metric on this. Okay? We can define, for example, there's many, many different metrics you can define on this. We can define what we call D1 of Fg. And we will define it like this, the supremum over all x in i of f of x minus g of x plus f prime of x minus g prime of x. What is the um, difference between these two distance functions? The slope must also be close. Yeah? So at each point, what you do is you look at every x again, and you look at the value of the functions, and you take the difference between the value of the functions. But you also take the difference between the slopes of the functions, the derivative of the functions at this point. Okay? So for example, here, the slope is quite different, even though the value of the functions themselves is very close. Here, for example, at this fixed point, the slope is different. Even if they have the same fixed point and the distance is zero, the, the slopes are different, so the distance is non-zero. Okay? So there's a very interesting uh, uh, to appreciate the difference between these two. This is also a metric on the space of continuous maps, so this also induces a topology. But these are different topologies. So two points, which one of these topologies is stronger? In the sense, which one? You might have two functions which are very close in one of these metrics, but very far in the other metric. D1 is stronger. D1 is stronger in what sense? That you can be very far in the D1 metric, even though you're very close in the D0 metric, right? For example, these functions, if you take very small epsilon, any, any two functions that are inside this neighborhood will be close in the C0 metric. But if, like in this case, you put some slopes and you change the slope quite a bit, they will be far away in the C1 metric. Let me give you a more explicit example, which I think helps very much to illustrate this. So. A remark. D0 and D1 induce a very different topologies on the space. Um, Okay, so in this case, you need the map to be differentiable, right? So in this case, Fg, Fg should be C1 for this to make sense. So, um, of course, for C1 functions, they're also continuous. So in the space of C1 functions, you can define both of these metrics. On the space just of continuous functions, you can only define this one. Right. But on the space of C1 functions, you can define both. So just on the space C1 i of C1 maps. So example, let, so example, 
suppose i is equal to d interval 0, 1, and let f of x be the constant function 1 half, so interval 0, 1, 1 half, so f of x is just constant function 1 half, right? And g of x is equal to 1 half plus epsilon sine x over epsilon. What does this look like? So, as you know, of course, the sign of anything oscillates between 1 and minus 1. Right? So it remains inside the epsilon neighborhood here. So we have, here we have 1 half plus epsilon, 1 half minus epsilon. Well, the only thing that this epsilon does is increase the number of oscillations, right? Because if epsilon is small, then really as x varies between 0 and 1, this becomes very, can, can go from 0 to becoming quite big, so there's more oscillations, right? So it looks like something like this. Where the number of oscillations increases with epsilon. So what is the C0 distance between these? So D0 between F and G is equal to epsilon. Let's parameterize this by epsilon. For the C1 distance, notice that the derivative exactly so the derivative of this is just cosine of x. Okay, when you differentiate, it's cosine of x. That oscillates also between 1 and minus 1. And the derivative of this, of course, is just equal to 0. Okay, so what is the C1 distance? is actually equal to 1 plus epsilon, right? 1 plus epsilon. Sorry? Yes. Um, maybe. Maybe, yes. You're right. So as epsilon goes to 0, okay, so the crucial observation here is what happens. You can take arbitrarily small epsilon, and what happens? The distance in the C0 distance between f and g is going to 0. The distance between f and g in the C1 is not going to 0. It's bounded, yes. Okay. Okay, let me, yes, you're, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. Okay, so let, let me also use this opportunity to remark that I chose to put a plus here. There's different ways in which you can write this. If you want, you can just take the maximum between these two. There's some slightly different ways of writing the norm. They're all absolutely equivalent. I just decided to write plus. But you're right, it's not completely clear how these cancel out a little bit. Yes. 
is zero. You're right. You're right. So this is probably this is probably equal to maybe equal to one, or it's not. Sure. Yes. Anyway, the important observation is that it's always greater than or equal to one. This distance. Okay. For me, this is a really interesting application. So you study in abstract, you study topology, you study function spaces, you study different topology on the same space. So what we have here is two topologies, it's the same space, okay? But what does it mean to have two different topologies on the same space? It means that you take a sequence of functions, it's the same sequence of functions, okay? In one case, this sequence of functions is converging to this case in one topology, in the sense that the distance is going to zero. In the other topology, it is not converging to this function. It's different ways of measuring distance between this, uh, within this space. Okay, I think this is a very simple but really excellent example to illustrate this. So it also shows how much stronger this C1 topology is, right? Because to converge in the C1 topology, you need to converge in a much stronger sense. The map needs to converge and the derivatives need to converge. Okay, so what is our conclusion of all of this about structural stability? Let me state the result here. So, position. At F, the hyperbolic C1 interval diffel, okay, always orientation preserving. Okay, so maybe I'll present this in a little table. It might be useful. So, We're interested in structural stability, and as you remember, there's two facts that affect the structural stability. One is the type of conjugacy that you define. So we can have either topological conjugacy, or we can have C1 conjugacy. And the other one is uh, the topology that we have on our space. So we can have the C0 topology, and we can have the C1 topology. Okay. And now we want to fill in, in each of these boxes, whether this map is structurally stable in this setting, or in this setting, or in this setting, or in that setting. Okay. So what is the result? What do you think are the results going to be? So um, three of these we are, are almost immediate, OK? The, the, the last one will be a little bit delicate. So first of all, under C1 conjugacy, what does C1 conjugacy mean? Do you remember? So, uh, hyperbolic C1 interval diffeomorphism, yes. So, we suppose we have F is a C1 hyperbolic interval diffeomorphism. So, So I, I didn't discuss, before going here, I didn't discuss in the case with several fixed points the problem of the C1 conjugacy. But you remember what are the obstructions to C1 conjugacy. When are two maps C1 conjugate? Two maps with the same number of fixed points, so they're topologically conjugate, when will they be also, when do we know for sure that at least they're not C1 conjugate?
they have a different number of fixed points, they're clearly not conjugate. But if they have the same number of fixed points so that they're topologically conjugate, what do we know about whether they might or might not be C1 conjugate? Exactly. The derivatives of the fixed points have to be the same, right? So if you have two maps, um, both of which have the same number of fixed points, so that these are topologically conjugate, but the derivative are different at the fixed points, then they cannot be C1 conjugate. Right? So what is the chance of getting structural stability for C1 conjugacy? If you perturb a little bit this map, either in the C0 or in C1 topology, it's clear that you can make small perturbations and you can change the derivative a little bit at the fixed point. Okay? Even if you fix epsilon, even in the C1 topology, you allow the derivative to be a little bit different. The C1 topology just says the map should be close and the derivative should be close, but not exactly the same. So clearly you can change a little bit this fixed point. Okay? So under C1 um, conjugacy, there's un insta unstable. There's no chance in both cases structurally unstable. I'm not giving a proof. I'm giving the statement of the proposition here, right? In the C0 topology, what do we think? We saw the example before. It means if you take, so you're looking at topological conjugacy now, and you're saying, okay, I, I just take an epsilon neighborhood of the graph, and I make a perturbation. Do I stay inside the same topological conjugacy class? No. Okay, so structurally unstable. So the only hope we have left is this one here when you make a small perturbation in the C1, which means that you assume that the graph is inside, um, inside this neighborhood and the derivative is also inside this neighborhood. And the, sorry, and the derivative is also epsilon close to the derivative. Okay? So in fact, we will get this structurally stable in this case. This is the only case in which we have structural stability. Okay, so I will give, the proof is not difficult, but maybe let's just take a couple of minutes break and then we'll come back to the proof. Okay, so let's prove So, in the C1 conjugate, we look at it, these different cases. So, for the C1 conjugacy, it's very easy. C1 conjugacy. Um, we need to show that a map F is structurally unstable, right? A hyperbolic linear map. So, we just, uh, if, if P is a fixed point of F, then we have this picture here. Okay. Then it is essentially obvious that you can find a nearby map that has a slightly different derivative at this point. You can even take this map to be almost the same until here, and then you just change the derivative a little bit, and you take another map that has a small de change of derivative there. Right? So this map is no longer C1 conjugate to the previous one. Okay. Then um, clearly we can find another map G with D1 FG less than or equal to epsilon such that um, and even the same fixed point, okay, with the same, with the same fixed point, but 
g prime of p different from f prime of p. And so f and so g is not c1 conjugate to f and so f is not structurally stable. So of course d1 less than or equal to epsilon is stronger than d0 f of g is equal to epsilon. So obviously exactly the same thing applies even more if you take this in the C0 topology. So this takes care of both of these cases in terms of the C1 conjugacy. This is yet another example of what I keep insisting of how strong the C1 conjugacy is, right? So you basically have very hard to have a structural stability in uh, with a C1 conjugacy. Although I should mention that there are certain situations, certain systems that have special symmetries. So uh, for example, you could say, okay, I want to look at all the interval, the C1 interval, hyperbolic interval diffeomorphisms that have some special property that is due, caused maybe by some model, some phenomena that you're trying to model or whatever reason. There might be some symmetry or some restriction on the kind of maps you can consider, which means that you can only perturb in a certain direction in a certain way. And it could be that within that subfamily, you do have C1 structural stability. Right? So I want to emphasize both of these things. So in this particular family of maps, which is all C1 interval hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, with the C1 conjugacy, you have structural instability. But if you take a subfamily of this, it could be that this family, in fact, fixes the derivative at the fixed point, at the fixed points. Even within, if you fix the derivative at these four fixed points, you still have a lot of perturbations you can make because you can change the derivative and the map everywhere else. And it will, might still be C1 conjugate if you fix the derivative at the fixed points. Right? So I'm not saying that there are no other maps that are C1 conjugate to this. Right? But just in this particular topology that we've chosen, there's quite a lot of scope for perturbations and therefore it's structurally unstable. If you limit the kind of perturbations you can make, then you might get structural stability. So again, this depends always very much, not only I implicit in the topology is the specific space that we've chosen. right? So this topology comes with a space. You could have the same topology, but on a subspace of the full space, and you could have structural stability here. Okay? So when we say topology, it comes with a space. So this is the space of all C0 maps of the interval, and this is the space of all C1 maps of the interval. Okay, so this is an important remark. Okay, so what about the under topological conjugacy? So um, let's look at the case in which we have topological conjugacy and uh, C0 topology. C0 topology. So again, we have our fixed point, which looks something like this. Okay, We have some epsilon neighborhood. We have some C0 neighborhood locally of this fixed point. We just need to do a local analysis. And we need to show that we can create some fixed points in here. Okay, and it's, it's uh, fairly clear. So really, I just need to say it. It's clear that you can perturb this to get some fixed points. So I will just write it. But um, So let P, a fixed point of F, fixed point of F, okay. Then um, for all epsilon, there exists a neighborhood E 
u p of p such that f of u p is contained in p minus epsilon p plus epsilon. Okay, so the way I'm formulating this is, so this is p, this maps to p, because it's a fixed point. So here is p plus epsilon, here is p minus epsilon. <coughs> so there exists some neighborhood that maps, some small neighborhood here that maps inside up. So this is u, sorry, up that maps inside this neighborhood. And then it's clear that we can change the, this interval, the way this interval maps to this interval, we can change it so that we create, it remains a, it remains a different morphism and it has additional fixed points. I'm not exactly sure how more, what more to say because it's clear. So we can make a small local perturbation of f in the C0 topology, C0 topology, such that uh, perturbation g of f of f in C0 topology, such that g has additional fixed points. in UP. And that way you lose the structural stability. Okay, so these are all really the, the structural instability are fairly clear to see. The less trivial part is the structural stability under the C1 topology. So let's finish with that. So now we look at topological conjugacy and C1 topology. Okay, so here we need to show that we cannot create any new fixed points and we cannot destroy any new fixed points. Right? So, um, Okay, we need to show that any sufficiently small C1 perturbation will have the same number of hyperbolic fixed points, these four hyperbolic fixed points in this case. So we need to show that we cannot destroy the hyperbolicity of these fixed points. Why can we not destroy the hyperbolicity of these fixed points? Exactly, exactly. Because since geometrically, exactly, geometrically it's clear to see that the derivative not equal to 1 means that this is transverse to the diagonal, so you can change the slope a little bit and it still stays transverse to the diagonal, right? Because in the C1 topology, you're allowed to change the derivative only by epsilon. So if epsilon is sufficiently small, it will not be 
become tangent to the diagonal. And intuitively, why can you not destroy any of these fixed points? Well, if you shift the map a little bit, you cannot destroy this fixed point. Right? You can change it a little bit, but you cannot move it only if this, if you have the graph very close to the diagonal, then you could shift the, this part of the graph up a little bit to destroy these fixed points. But of course, you need to shift it up by more than some epsilon sufficiently small. If epsilon is sufficiently small, this bit will always be below the diagonal. Right? If, epsilon, if you take a point that's below the diagonal for sufficiently small epsilon, even in the C0 topology, this will remain below the diagonal. And whereas this will be, remain above the diagonal, so you have this point is above the diagonal, this point is below the diagonal, this point is above the diagonal, so you must have at least these two fixed points in between. So you cannot really destroy the fixed points. Right? Let me try to write down these arguments for me. And then we need to show that uh, you cannot create any more fixed points, which is the most crucial thing. Right? So um, how do we do it? So we need to split we're going to have two separate arguments we're going to look so if these are the fixed points this is the fixed points this is the fixed points we're going to take this these are also fixed points we're going to take some delta neighborhoods of the fixed points here 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 and here and then we're going to look outside these delta neighborhoods. We're going to say things cannot change because here you're far away from the diagonal. And so when you make a small perturbation, you cannot intersect the diagonal. And then here we're going to look at the situation separately. So there exists delta um, so let, sorry, let epsilon greater than 0, and g i to i, such that d1 of fg less than or equal to epsilon. So there exists delta and delta prime greater than 0. and neighborhoods up equals p minus delta p plus delta for each fixed point p for f um, such that they're all disjoint, such that up, uq is empty if p is different from q. And f of p minus f of p plus or minus delta is greater than or equal to delta prime. for every fixed p. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to isolate these two these uh, neighborhoods. So here, of course, this, this is one-sided. In the case of the two fixed points here, they're one-sided. Okay. In the other case, they're two-sided neighborhoods. And we have this property that outside these neighborhoods, the graph is far away from the diagonal. Okay. These are these neighborhoods. So first of all, these are all pairwise disjoint. And second, what I'm saying here is that f of p minus f of p plus or minus delta so you take f of p and you take f of p minus delta, then this distance here is greater than or equal to delta prime. And this distance here is greater than or equal to delta prime. And this distance here is greater than or equal to delta prime. And this 
distance here, okay, and also, and also f of x minus x is greater than or equal to delta prime for all x that does not belong to the union of the up for all fixed p. So I can choose delta prime sufficiently small that all the points outside these neighborhoods have a distance from the diagonal of greater than delta prime. And then I'm going to consider these two situations separately. So um, So as long as G, so if epsilon is small enough, enough, for example, epsilon less than delta prime, then any map that is even G0 close to F satisfies g of x is different from x for all x that does not belong to the union overall uh, to the union let me call this just u it does not belong to u okay this is the first statement this is for points outside these neighborhoods. Okay, so this is uh, uh, important to understand what the, the argument I'm saying. I'm saying, okay, I'm dividing the argument into two parts. I define these neighborhoods, and I say outside these neighborhoods, the graph is always more than delta prime from the diagonal. So that means as long as I take epsilon smaller than delta prime, then any epsilon neighborhood, even in the C0 topology, cannot intersect the diagonal, so I cannot create any new um, fixed points in this region outside these neighborhoods, right? So this guarantees that if epsilon is small enough, I cannot create any things, any new fixed points out here. So all I need to worry is inside these neighborhoods. So what do I do inside these neighbors? Now I need to show that inside these neighbors, I do not create and I do not uh, get rid of any fixed points. So for each inside this neighborhood, inside each neighborhood UP, um, so what does the neighborhood up so by this property here so inside each up we have that f um, f of p plus or minus f of p minus delta and f of p plus delta lie on opposite sides of the diagonal So if d0, again, f of g is less than delta, then g of p minus delta and g of p plus delta still lie on opposite sides of the diagonal. Right? So here I know that this distance at these endpoints is bigger than delta. This is bigger than, de uh, sorry, bigger than delta prime. This is bigger than delta prime. So if I take a small perturbation even in the C0 topology and I uh, take a small perturbation, then I know that this point still lies above the diagonal. This other point still lies below the diagonal, so there must exist at least one fixed point in there. So this shows that I cannot destroy any fixed point, right? 
so there exists at least one fixed point for G in this neighborhood UP. And I'm almost finished. So because in this neighborhood of this fixed point, I have this picture here. So I have that this distance here is greater than delta prime. This distance here is also greater than delta prime. Okay. So if I look at the image, so this is the point P. This is the neighborhood U of P. So the end points, what I just said there is that the, I, what I'm trying to show, is it clear? I've, I've dealt with what happens outside these neighborhoods. Now I need to show that inside this neighborhood, any small perturbation will still have a unique hyperbolic fixed point. Okay? So I need to show that I cannot lose this fixed point here. And the only way to lose this fixed point is if the whole graph is either below or above the diagonal. But this cannot be because this distance is delta prime, this distance is delta prime. As long as the C0 distance of G is less than delta prime, then this point will remain above, this point will remain below, and I need to cross the diagonal. Okay? So this shows that I cannot lose that fixed point. The only thing that's left to show it is that I cannot create any new fixed points. Okay? And this is the only place where we use the fact that the perturbation is in the C1 metric. Both of these properties just use the fact that these maps are close in the C0 metric. As we saw in the C0 metric, you could create some new fixed points. Okay? But in the C1 metric, again, is very simple. So if G, so, um, So if delta is sufficiently small, then we can guarantee that f prime of x is different from 1 for all x in up. Right? So I can assume, in fact, this big, yeah. So since the derivative here at p is different from 1, I can assume we have a small enough neighborhood so that the derivative everywhere in f of p is different from 1. So if g, if epsilon is small and distance f of g is less than or equal to epsilon, okay, then also g prime of x should be different from 1 for all x in up. So I assume this is very small. The derivative is different from 1. Uh, also for g, therefore, it's different from 1 if I take epsilon less than 1 minus f prime of x, basically. And therefore, I can use the same argument by contradiction that I used before, right? So assume, assume by contradiction that there exists q in up with g of q equals q, so that there exists another fixed point, which is what we're trying to disprove. So we have now our map G. Suppose that there is another fixed point in UP. And then this means exactly by before, so by the mean value theorem, by the mean value theorem, F uh, G of P minus, uh, right, and we suppose so, uh, sorry, we suppose that there are two fixed points because we don't know that fixed. So we suppose that there exists Q and Q prime in UP such that G of Q equals Q 
and g of q prime equals q prime. Sorry, my handwriting. So we want to show that there's a unique fixed point. Assume by contradiction there exists two. Then you have that g, I'm sorry, this notation is really gq minus g of q prime is equal to f prime of um, x, x prime of z times q minus q prime for some z in this interval, q, q prime. Sorry? Uh, sorry, thank you, g prime. And this implies, because these are fixed points, this implies that g prime of z is equal to 1. Okay, so here I guess it should, it should have, well, it doesn't matter because the orientation preserving is sort of positive. But g prime of z is equal to 1, which is a contradiction, which is a contradiction. because we've taken the neighborhood small so that this is different from one. So this completes the proof, right? So we've shown, make sure you look at this part of the proof, okay? This is a not a very difficult proof, but it's very important. We, we divide it into certain ways. We use kind of several bits of information, several definitions. And in particular, in this last part, we really, um, you really use various aspects of, you use the C0 and the C1 topology in various situations. And we look at the inside these neighbors, outside the neighbors. So this is a very important proof to, to make sure you review. Okay, so this basically completes our section on interval diffeomorphism. After linear maps, we've looked at interval diffeomorphism. We've looked at the notion of hyperbolic interval diffeomorphism. We've done essentially a complete classification up to topological conjugacy. And we've looked at the problem of structural stability for interval diffeomorphism. So this also more or less for the moment completes our study of one-dimensional systems, which are the systems in one dimension in which we've introduced and experimented a lot of concepts and techniques and from the next lecture we're going to start looking at two-dimensional or higher dimensional systems starting from linear maps which again are the simplest cases in higher dimensions okay thank you